Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed and I'm working as a part of the LinkedIn sales solution team and uh, really excited to be part of this event and uh, hope everyone is enjoying. Great. So uh, today we're going to discuss and we're going to talk about how the world of communication is changing. And um, just to give you a very o brief overview of the usage of social media from a personal experience as an employee in LinkedIn. And then uh, Aaron will walk us around how to use LinkedIn sales platform in identifying decision makers and how to generate business opportunities. So uh, the world of communication have dramatically changed and have divided them into three uh, generations. So the first generation is the pre-web 1990s. So if we looked at the, how we've, we've done business in the past, it usually the impulse was like in newspapers and you go into your um, vendors and check who's there and try to have a conversation with them without actually knowing much more about what exactly are those vendors are doing. So basically, you will have the introductions or the speak with them on a face-to-face -face basis. Uh, in the second generation is when we have the internet introduced to us, where we had an opportunity to gain insights about the vendors and read some blogs and search the products or the services that, uh, that we're trying to acquire or trying to buy. Uh, lately, and the third generation is when we had the social medias like Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, where we had the opportunity to have much more insights about how and what exactly are the products that we're trying to sell or trying to buy, I'm sorry. So uh, think about, for example, if a product that you're trying to find out about or trying to, to, uh, to buy, you will go into... Google or LinkedIn, you will search about this product, you will find similar people who have bought this product and you will run your search on that product and obviously you will have much more insights and you will run like a, something like a business case and you identify if this product is useful or not and then you'll go to the seller with a mind state of actually 60-70% you've had the buying decision already made based on the insights that you have on the social media. So um, as, a, as a LinkedIn um, employee, uh, personal experience on three different platforms, the, my three uh, platforms that I usually use, um, Facebook as a number one. So Facebook will be my social platform where I usually have the connections friends, family, uh, f f f like friends from the college, uh, from the business, and the application that I'll be using most would be something like photo sharing, uh, games, uh, sharing some um, posts that are not really relevant to the business, but it will be more into a kind of individual and friends connections. Uh, the second platform would be the Twitter, so my, that's my public communication where I will have my connection, most of my connection will be fans, followers, and I will use Twitter as a kind of where I hashtag something that I would like to search on, and then in real time micro blogging I will have more insights about this um, word or this service that I'm trying to find on. Um, of course, LinkedIn, the third platform, which obviously most of the time I'll be spending on. Um, most of my connections will be, of course, my colleagues from the business, uh, people that I'm doing business with, people that I'm trying to get in touch with them. And it will be uh, my professional identity and how I would like to reach out to people and how to get more insights about those people. And when I think about LinkedIn, I will think about how exactly I would like to appear in front of people that I want to make business with them. Um, with that said, I'll pass it over to Aaron to discuss how LinkedIn is transforming how companies sell. 
Thanks. Uh, my name's Aaron, and I work in Sales Solutions along with Atmed at LinkedIn. So I think today one of the things that we kind of discussed about is how important it is to be found. Where with Linked, it's kind of more about how to find the right people. So I think, you know, whether you're being found through SEO, PPC, if you're being ranked on Google, with LinkedIn, we developed a new platform in July last year called Sales Navigator, which is separate from free LinkedIn. So when you log in, you can save accounts, which is companies you want to work with or maybe companies you are working with, and a list of leads of the right people you want to speak to. With that information, it will then generate a news feed of updates, posts, all the information you need to know about them companies and them individuals. So one thing we do know at LinkedIn, the buying process has changed. I think the way I used to do business maybe five, six years ago is definitely different now. We know that there's around 5.4 people involved in every buying decision. So when I speak to a prospect about Sales Navigator, I might talk to the sales director who might involve marketing, that's where the budget will come from. Final say might be with the finance or C-level. There might also be a sales individual involved in that to see can he adapt and use that tool. 75% of buyers are now pretty much made their mind up before any involvement from a rep. And I think, you know, if anybody here now, if you buy a website or you use anyone for a service, you'll use social media to, to find out about that person. I think before, you know, you could learn recommendations and maybe word of mouth, it's completely changed. And I think it's even, you can resemble it to when you buy a phone, like I bought a phone a month ago, five years ago, I would have gone in, spoke to the sales rep, told them what I'm looking for, but this time I know I want either an iPhone, a Samsung, iPhone 4, 5 or 6. You're a lot more you know, savvy on the technology or the product or service that you want to buy. And one thing that, well, our mission at LinkedIn for sales solutions is to get rid of the cold call. Before I worked at LinkedIn, the only way I could do business was with a cold outreach, making maybe 60 to 100 calls a day, maybe blast emailing. They don't really provide the response they used to. I know before that might have been a good way of doing business, but you know, I speak to different organizations on a daily basis, and some will say, you know, cold calling or cold outreach works for me. We know that the percentage is getting smaller every year, so that's why at LinkedIn we introduce social selling, so you can contact people in a warmer approach or through a warm introduction. So you know, how, has, how well has your team adapted to you know, the new normal? And here are just three examples that when I speak to sales directors or sales leaders, some of the examples they might give to me, but I can also relate to these because this is something that I found when I was, before I worked at LinkedIn, when I was using a cold outreach to sell. So one thing we do advise at LinkedIn is to have more than one contact with any, any prospect. And we call that multi-threading. So, you know, if you do have one contact within a company and they leave, if you don't have any information on that contact, it could be just sitting in your pipeline, you're not going to know when they've left or if they're still within the company. With Sales Navigator, you can track every single individual. So I have my accounts mapped to the UK. If any sales director gets a new job or gets promoted in the UK, I get an alert to tell me that. And only two weeks ago, I walked into a meeting and I got an alert to say it was actually the birthday of the CEO that I was meeting. It's a great opener. I congratulate and say happy birthday to him. He has no idea that I know that information, but to him, it looks like that I've made an effort to research him before I go in. So relying on the buyer to inform you on key updates, I think that's something we wish they would do more because nobody really wants to be sold to. And... You know, I think it's a classic case of having that problem of speaking to the right person, finding out later that they might have left or they're working in a different role really is going to you know, hamper you know, your success of speaking to the right person. And the last one that I can really resemble to before I worked at LinkedIn is pounding the phone. I think working hard does not always give you the best results. I think working smarter is the way to go forward. And I think as a sales professional, what I used to concentrate on was my pipeline and the quality of it, and time management. Am I speaking to the right people, or am I wasting time speaking to the wrong people? My biggest challenge was speaking to the right people. With Sales Navigator, you can actually select if you want to speak to director, vice president, or C-level. So you can actually get around 
secretaries or people who might be in the way. So it's a good way to use your time more effectively. So Styles Navigator is a premium license and to get access to it, it is paid. So you look at LinkedIn for a free platform. <coughs> On average, when you go to a paid license, your network outreach will grow by around 98%. With free LinkedIn, you have access to your first and second degree connections, so that's your connections, connections. With Sales Navigator, the third degree is your connections, 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 so a bit confusing, but that's how it works. And if you're using LinkedIn for sales, it's gonna be really important that if you do wanna to speak to C-level or vice presidents, you have access to everyone, not just a number on, that would have come with free LinkedIn. So what we definitely find is that I know sales director is my target that I like to speak to. When I run a search for the UK, I know, I think there's around 27,800. I can get that search back extremely quick and then I can start filtering down who I want to speak to. So with Sales Navigator, on the actual platform itself, with all your accounts and all the people that you have saved as leads, you will have all the information you need, whether that be job changes, whether they're posting information within the company. LinkedIn now owns a company called Newsle. So if any of your prospects have been mentioned across the web worldwide, you will see that there as well. And I think, you know, for me to log in on a daily basis, what's more important is that every search that I make, I can save. So if I use my sales director search, 27,000 and odd results, it's very hard for me to track that. But because I can save that search, LinkedIn will then send, well, Sales Navigator will then send me a weekly update of movements within that, uh, that search. So effectively sends me a weekly pipeline of just decision makers. So once you make your searches of who you want to find, Sales Navigator will then push that information to you on a weekly basis. I think, you know, it, it took me probably about an hour, two hours to set up all my searches, but now I don't have to do any prospecting again because I get that information on a Monday morning. Pretty much, you know, comparing day to night to before I worked at LinkedIn, going through books, going through Google to try and find the right people to speak to, having that information, for me, it's kind of gold dust for any sales individual. Oops, pressing the wrong button there, so. Just these slides here, so. Sales Navigator is gonna be your partner through every stage of the relationship development. You know, finding the right people quickly. So I think time management is gonna be a, definitely a big thing. When it comes to every month or every quarter, every sales professional will always wish they had an extra week or an extra couple of days to close that deal. So by using Sales Navigator, you're gonna be using your time very effectively to make sure you're not missing any opportunities. I think staying informed is a big one because with my prospects, I wanna know what's going on. I wanna know if a manager has been pro promoted to a director because then he's more relevant to me. I want to know that if a director in one company has moved to another company, I want to know that as well because I have a direct route into that company, maybe a warmer route because I have a relationship with him anyway. And engaging with the customers just by seeing that it's somebody's birthday or anniversary, sending them a quick message just to congratulate them on that event. You're not really going out on a hard pitch and you'll be surprised how responsive they are to you. And everyone you save as a lead, they have no idea you know all this information. Only if they buy Sales Navigator and they use it the same way. So it's not really gonna come up that much. So the three dimensions are pr pretty interesting to me because when you sit down at your desk and you're finding out who the targets are that you wanna speak to, you know, how connected are you to that person? So if you're on LinkedIn, you know, are you connected to the right person? And more importantly, are people's in your, people in your team connected to that right person? One big thing as well is your competition. Everyone will have competition. Are you, is your competition connected to, you know, your prospects more than you are? If they are, that's something that you, should, you need to watch. And change, has your connectivity changed over time? So, you know, if you're connected to the right people within the company, you know, are you making any progress with that person? So with all three, connectivity, competition, and change, it's gonna be really important to have all that information and use it on Sales Navigator to find, relate, and engage with the right people. So one of the features on Sales Navigator is team link. So if I reach out to a prospect 
And if anybody with a sales navigator license in LinkedIn is connected to that person, it will tell me that I have a team link introduction. So what it will do is highlight any existing relationships between me and my team and that, uh, that prospect. So we had, this is an example from the US. Um, we had a new marketing executive who had Nicole Saunders as a prospect. Now, there was a team link introduction, Steve Saunders, who sits probably about 20 feet away from him. He chose not to use that, and he chose to use an email. So I think because he was new, you know, he probably just thought it was the easiest way. But what he failed to notice was, not only do they share the same name, they share the same house. Probably to get to one step further, they share the same bed because they're actually married. So for him to get an introduction into his prospect, how, what more powerful than to get it through her husband. So this is just a map of where he sits and where her husband sits. Now, he chose not to do that. After you know, he had a conversation that probably wasn't that comfortable, but it goes to show you never know who knows who. And by having team link to uncover any hidden relationships you know, within a company is a really, really powerful feature. And I think using Sales Navigator as a tool might be more suited maybe for people here to find new business rather than you know, people finding you for the, the new business. So when I have these conversations every day, a lot of people will ask me, why LinkedIn for sales? So this slide's actually a bit outdated. We actually have 360 million members. We're growing at two members every second, which works at about one million members every five days. We launched in Chinese about six to eight weeks ago, and we launched in Arabic two weeks ago. So we provide over two billion uh, updates per week, and billions are professional relationships. So one of our values at LinkedIn is relationships matter. If you can prospect into one of your prospects off the back of a relationship, a warm introduction, or by using insights of that information you know about that individual, you're going to be more successful. I think if you have a, a list of people that you want to contact, if you know where they've worked before, what their skills are endorsed for, when their birth is, the more information you know about that person, the better. And with LinkedIn Sales Navigator, it pretty much opens up the network for you to, to use as a sales tool. And with that, I think like, you know, before I use LinkedIn Sales Navigator, wherever I go from LinkedIn, I would definitely use it as a sales tool because the more insights I, can, I have on my prospects, the better. And pretty much that's it. I didn't want to talk about Sales Navigator too much and you know, turn it into a pitch, but we're definitely happy to answer any questions or even after this event, reach out to us you know, with any questions you might have. We'd be more than happy to to help you out and guide you through the process. Okay, so um, how many of you pay for a premium LinkedIn account? How many of you pay for it out of your own pocket versus your company's pocket? Interesting. So uh, I was interviewing a bunch of sales reps in, in the States. We were doing a bunch of focus groups. And we asked them what sales tools they used, and LinkedIn came up pretty often. These were people selling to uh, ad agencies, pretty large you know, customers. Then I asked how many of them, how many of them were use, paid for their own LinkedIn account. And all of these sales reps used, paid it for their own LinkedIn account out of their own pocket. Very interesting. So tell us how, um, how does Sales Navigator, is that part of the premium account, or is it a separate add-on service? Yeah, so um, Sales Navigator, it is the premium account, the highest level of premium account. So the is that the $99 account? Well, it's $1,200 a year, so that's £775 a year. So uh -huh. the way people pay for it themselves, we provide this on a corporate account, so we provide it to the company. Uh -huh. So they own the licenses, they have ownership. So anyone who's expensing a license back to the company, if you leave that company, you keep that license. The company has no power over that. Where on the ownership as a corporate account, then you know, if that individual leaves, they can retain that license and give it to a new individual. Right. A lot of people so I seat license. Yeah, yeah, so a lot of people I speak to are expensing it back, but when you don't have it on a corporate account, there's a number of features you don't get. I think if you have a single license, it's designed for a small company, maybe two or three users, but once you go from five and above, that's when we can put you on a corporate account. 
And, and how many uh, people do you have signed up for Sales Navigator? That's a question I don't <laughs> have the answer to now, but you know, what I can tell you is that from the people that do sign up, I can use probably SAP as an example. Yeah. You know, known for being a stubborn company and open to change. They started off with us for, I think, with about 2,000 licenses. This year, no, last year, sorry, they rolled it out to over 25,000 reps. So whether you have five people or whether you have 25,000 people. And does it integrate with salesforce.com? It does integrate with salesforce.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what you see is an iframe on your homepage. Everything you see in Sales Navigator, you will see in Salesforce. So uh -huh. you can see the updates on a company, and you can also see individuals that you can save as leads as well. Okay. Questions from the audience? Just There's to add uh, oh, one thing. So sure, in terms Amit. of, yeah, the number of uh, customers, so for UK and Ireland, uh, we have more than around 4,000 customers who are uh, on a corporate account. So they are corporate So you have 4,000 corporate accounts with thousands beneath that, or 4,000 4, users within maybe 100 corporate accounts? No, it's 4,000 companies. Companies? Yeah. So, so you could have company, there's different 400,000 if they all had 1,000. Yeah, right? so it okay. depends on the number of Yeah, so you have 4,000 corporate accounts. And do you guys sell for, for LinkedIn? Yeah. You guys are sellers. Mm -hmm. So you use, you, you, I presume you use this. Yeah. Of course, yeah, it's the only tool that we use. <laughs> so we, we, we have a you, Use the mic, though. Sorry, we, you know, we have a saying at LinkedIn, we leave what we sell. We can't sell something unless we use it. Yeah. So definitely we use it. Dog got to eat the dog food. That's it, yeah. yeah. Okay, I know there's a question back here. Your name is? Uh, Sharon from One One Eight. Sharon. Hi, I have a quick question about emails within LinkedIn. So I'm an, an, an in-mail user. What percentage of people register their personal Hotmail account versus their work email when they sign up to LinkedIn? Um, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, that's something I'd check w with engineers, but we advise people to, to have their work email with LinkedIn. Um, I think, you know, LinkedIn is definitely your own platform, your personal platform. For Before I worked at LinkedIn, it was my own email there. You know, it's a good question when you say, you know, email versus email. I think if, if you get an email address of anyone in, at senior level, you know, their PA or secretary can, can see that email coming through. They might validate it to see if it's important. But with an email, it goes to their direct account. And if they do have a Gmail account, for example, it is going to go straight to that Gmail account. So probably to answer your question, unfortunately, I, I don't know the, the majority of versus who, but... Do you think you could find out and let us know? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you want to, like, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, I can definitely find that because they have that information, you know, behind the scenes. I can find that out for you. Thank you. So, so I'm not going to ask how many of you use LinkedIn, but how many of you use, because I think probably everybody does, but on... Average day, how many of you use LinkedIn five times or less? Show of hands. More than five times. More than 10 times. You know, so sort of five to 10. Well, you guys use it all day long. You got to make money with it. Kimberly, you have a well, question. I, I think, you know, when, when we put this session together, we had a fantastic, like, one hour telephone call. Because, and what I'd like to ask everybody here, um, how many have their because we talked about this with major accounts in this in media accounts for the companies that are here versus small businesses and how many are actually there. So what would interest me is how many here have thought about using LinkedIn on their major accounts or, or larger media customers? Are your sales reps using it or even thinking about using it? You want, you, let's have a dialogue. Let's yeah, get try. let's get Sh Sharon the mic, and she can. Let's get her a mic. Yeah. So we have thought about it. We've got um, probably about thirty people who sell to C grade or above, and one of the issues we found, hence the question, is yeah. that a lot of the emails that our guys try to use end up in Gmail accounts. Mm -hmm. yep. I, I know within our own business, when I did a bit of a survey, at least half were using their own Hotmail or Gmail accounts which is great, but then it takes two or three weeks for them to respond if they do. Well, and, and that, for us, was the biggest obstacle. Mm -hmm. Well, it's why I talked earlier about, you know, who's paying for this mm -hmm. and, you know, whose license it is, because I do see that, you know, if people move from job to job, then what happens if, 
And today I'm in LinkedIn as Neil at Buzzboard, let's say. I leave Buzzboard, then what happens? And, the, and so I think that that's why people who are in there probably tend to use NB Polachek at Gmail instead of a corporate email. That's just my... But I wonder if there's a space for LinkedIn to perhaps force its users to use work-based yeah. information because, after all, this is not Facebook. Right. Well, just to add on this one, so we always encourage our users and members that to have uh, multiple email addresses associated to their account. So if you go to the settings on your home page, you would have a chance to add your primary email address and secondary email address. And whenever you have a communication... How many of you knew that, just out of curiosity? About five people, maybe six out of 150. So. Keep going. That's yeah. great information. So, <laughs> thank you. So um, it's always great because when you have this chance, you would have any communication coming to you by in-mail. It will always go to your uh, LinkedIn messaging system, which is the in-mail, and also it will drop down to your email address associated on those accounts. Mm -hmm. So um, as well, if you're leaving the company or you're, uh, you're not having access to your LinkedIn for some reasons, you'd have an access to those messaging to your email address associated with this account. So I, I think another question would be, do you know how many, what, how, what percentage of smaller businesses, SMBs, are actually the owners of those businesses are using um, LinkedIn now? Do you have any statistics on that at all? No, again, I, I don't have, them stats with me, but this is what we can find out. But uh, as long as, you know, when you look at an SMB, as long as you have more than five users within your company, then that's when we recommend you start using LinkedIn as a corporate account. Before I worked at LinkedIn, I worked for myself. I was pretty much, you know, me and one other employee, so I wouldn't have a corporate account, so I'd get no use out the extra features. So we always try to make sure that, you know, we provide the right product for the right person, yeah. rather than you know, provide a product that is not going to suit them because with LinkedIn members come first. So you look at, you use SAP as an example. SAP is not important to us, but every individual member is. So that's the way we look at it. Yeah. So, but. Uh, you know, we were having, Aaron and I were discussing this earlier that, you know, my sense is that a lot of the true SMB merchants who do B to C, the roofer, the, the per person who sells carpeting, those kinds of folks, I doubt, will ever find great value in LinkedIn. Uh, so, you know, it's really for selling to B2B, where that B is selling to other businesses, my, is my guess. Is that yeah, no, absolutely. So you wouldn't get many roofers or carpenters on LinkedIn, you know, offering services. But again, no, no matter what industry you're in, it never harms you to have a professional identity. I sure. think Facebook is great. For, for them kind of trades, but mm -hmm. we've noticed more, like especially photographers, contacting people, telling them they don't have a great LinkedIn picture, profile picture, and offering them a deal. So that's one way they're going into it. So definitely, you know, there is scope out There's there. There's a whole cottage industry taking <laughs> pictures for the dating sites and LinkedIn and all these things and writing the bios. I mean, there's a huge uh, cottage industry out there. But what was interesting, when we, ha when we had the telephone call, and I was just sitting playing around, and I did professionals, okay? So looking for professionals, if you put location and professionals in, then you can also start to target more in the SMB category, not just the major account category that people are selling to. Yeah. That worked. That worked quite well. I think as well, at LinkedIn, we have a program called Resume to Reputation. So, you know, when you look at most LinkedIn profiles, the individual's kind of, in a way, no, they might not be looking for another job, but they're advertising themselves for... They're always looking for another yeah, job. Yeah, okay, fair Come enough. On. So, you know, they're, they're talking about their achievements. When, if you look at your summary, that's probably the most important part of your LinkedIn profile. So my summary, I try to tailor it to the audience that I want to prospect into. So when I contact C-level or vice president, if he reads my summary and it's like, okay, my name's Aaron and I hit my target last month, he, I'm going to look like a salesperson, but when I talk about I help companies increase quality of lead generation, how to use LinkedIn more effectively, my response rates, you know, it, it is higher. And I think one thing we do provide with the corporate accounts is training. So, you know, even like we look at everyone's profile who's going to have a license. If you don't have a great profile, 
it's kind of you know hamper yeah. your responses. S question in the back. Mike's on its way there. <clears throat> yeah, I have a question regarding the data that you own. Do you do you share this data or do you sell it to any third party? Uh, in any form, if it's individual or aggregated. Yeah, sure. With then, a profile or something like that. Great question, question is, do they sell aggregated or individual data to third parties? Great question. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, according like one of our values is member first, of course, and uh, we do not sell any kind of data to any third party. So um, what our mission is basically to connect the world professionals to make them more productive and successful. So you still hold that kind of privacy, you'd have it on your profile, whether you would like people to reach out to you or not. Uh, if When you view other people's profiles, other members' profiles, you could change the profile visibility, so all kind of privacy is being set according to your settings. And um, yeah, so to answer your questions, yeah, no, that's definitely not. There's a question in the back. Hi, as someone that uses uh, LinkedIn, uh, now I'm going to be more discoverable. Is it possible for us not to have people that hide their, um, uh, that come across as anonymous, not actually look at our profiles? Yes. Yeah, so or, or what I should say is, are you going to allow these super users to remain anonymous? Yeah, so that is down again to your own preference. So everyone has the, the opportunity to switch their license on private, for example. Well, I, I have mine on private. I, because I work with a lot of companies, I have to check profiles every day. I don't want to look like a stalker. So that's why I have mine on private. So, but well, um, again, so that's, that's how you can go anonymous, and yeah, I can look so at your every, profile. Everyone here is going to have a, loads of anonymous views on their profile yeah. after this, so that's going to be Because you're going to go to all of our <laughs> profiles, and but, it's, uh, you're going to be Aaron. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, it, it's on the individual preference because, you know, everyone's own profile, it, you can set the settings how you want. So when you look at your profile views, if there is anonymous settings on there, pretty much, no, we, we can't really change that. It's just down to the individuals. Right, so the super users, they can keep looking at us and we've just got to accept it. Unfortunately, Sorry, the people yeah. that are anonymous. But what, what you can do is you can switch, you know, your profile onto private where you don't accept in mouse or they can't view your connections. So you can kind of limit the access they have to you. Put and a little wall around it. Yeah, so that's, that, that's done in your settings. So if they can't contact you by email, sending you messages and they can't view your connections, prob that'll probably be a good step for them getting in touch with you. Okay. Uh, I just thought if somebody's anonymous, I, I should have the ability to have them not look at my profile full stop. Well, I think there's a movement there. So, yeah. so let's talk about the company for a minute. Oh, there's a question in the, over there in the corner. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Jakub Riba from uh, Prague, Czech Republic. You raised an interesting question that you recently launched LinkedIn in Chinese and Arabic languages. So because I come from a small country with, uh, you know, language very specific, uh, I would like to ask you how do you overcome the language barrier? Because, for example, from my connections that I have on LinkedIn, none of them have uh, the LinkedIn uh, in Czech language. So all of my colleagues and, uh, you know, uh, all the people I met who are from Czech Republic, they all have their profiles in English. Because basically, since one of your connections is from abroad, then uh, none of the information on your profile would make any sense. So do you see a demand in those countries or in, in those like market? I, obviously, you know, Chinese is a huge market, but uh, does it actually make sense to have LinkedIn in a different language or will be, there be like multiple languages set up for some users and so on? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question, of course. So I, I think um, f I've been in LinkedIn for the last two years and how we uh, develop uh, the languages part and how we look when we open new markets is how is our penetration number in, in terms of the member growth. So um, in terms of the, the number of members within um, Russia or Czech Republic and the part of Eastern Europe is still growing. So we don't have yet the demand to, to open up the language part. But I, uh, I'm sure that like for the last two years I had, like there's too many languages we opened, like 
the, the Arabic, the Chinese, and uh, we have more than 23 languages, and I'm sure that this will happen very soon, because uh, if we looked at, as Aaron said, that like, we're growing at two members per second, so there will be huge growth going on this year, or maybe like by next year in the region. So this is something that definitely we are looking for, and it will be happening soon. Follow-up question. Question was maybe slightly heading somewhere else. It's like, uh, I mean, not the localization of the service as such, but more the profile information. Uh, if basically you're somehow working with uh, the fact that a Chinese person w would like to have his profile in Chinese as a primary language, but maybe as a secondary one, also in English or in in, in multiple languages, is there something? within LinkedIn that you would be working in. So, you know, obviously, you know, that you can localize, you know, the, the service as such into Chinese so that the menus and the controls and everything is your mother language. I mean, like, more working with the, with the content of the profiles or if you, there is any, any vision that it will be so automatically translated. It's an translated. interesting question because as I, as I listen, you know, I think about myself, should I have my profile in Chinese? If I want, no, if I want to, you know, be called on by, by people in China. Is that going on? Where people are, ver have versions in different languages? Yeah, so you have the, the access to change your profile language and your home page according to the languages available on the network. So you can so, have it in multiple languages? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, you can have that. And in terms of the support, we actually we cover all the languages, so if you need like support in terms like the enterprise support, the customer support, sales support, we provide that in your own language as well. So I have a final question. If I have one too. Okay, so you can have the last I word. I always want the answer to this, okay? And let's okay. see if we can give it. Can I ask one first, though? You always go first. You, no, you're la <laughs> ladies first. You go first. Uh, I, I just, I just want to know how come, um, if this is so broad on sales and LinkedIn is really trying to, to push connections, how come you're limited to 30 groups on the profiles? Do you know? You can only join 30 groups. Is that on a free license? or? No, I have paid. paid. 30. Yeah. Do you know why? Uh, well, the, the reason, um, like, I don't know the reason, actually, but I know that there's a limit of, to join the groups, which is 30, yeah. Yeah, so but you myself, don't know why. Myself, I can join more than 30 groups. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would have to, yeah, so I would have to leave the group and then So join you're another. a groupie. Is I'm that a groupie. what you're I'm saying, Kim? You're a groupie. <laughs> yeah, you want to be a uh, member of more uh, groups. Okay, go ahead, Neil. You're on. Okay, yeah. so could you guys tell us what it's like to work for Jeff Weiner and LinkedIn and sort of, you know, your perception of, of, of the company as a, as a place to, to work. I mean, I think I read maybe in the last week in Fortune or somewhere that it was rated a, like in the top five or ten of companies to work for, I think in the Bay Area maybe, this, this survey. But can you guys talk about it? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's definitely a great place to work. I think one thing that is refreshing is, you know, when you do work for there, it's pretty much like you're running your own business. Your accounts are your own business. It's not a nine to five job, so you're expected to hit a certain number every quarter. As long as you hit them numbers like any job, then you know it's going to be fine. As goes to perks and benefits, you know they provide free food. You know it's great holidays, great pay. It's definitely a great place to work for. I think there's a trend with American companies when you look at, say, Google, Facebook, Twitter, HubSpot. They definitely have a different approach to working with maybe Irish and UK companies. I think my experience working with UK Irish companies de definitely very different to American companies. Uh -huh. So good different. Uh, much better, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but no, definitely it is a great place to work, and I think it's you can reach out. It's not kind of you'll have the managers, directors sitting on the floor rather than hid away in offices. So do, th do you have a sense that, that the leadership has a real direction for the company and oh, yeah, absolutely. everybody's so, lined up to that direction? Yeah, because you know, our vision is to create you know, economic opportunity for everyone on the planet. There's an estimate, three, you know, 650 million professionals in the world. We have 360 million members, so we're getting halfway there. Halfway there. Halfway there, yeah, close, getting there soon. But... With the global kickoff we had in LA this year, when you see the visions for the company, 
you know, I think it's always positive when you have a CEO who's very direct, still very focused, and, you know, is very targeted where you want to go. Yeah. All right. Any final questions from these folks? Let's give a warm round of applause. Thank you very much, Aaron and Ahmed.